well, this is what we're going to do. I, you know, when I talked to them and I told him that, something just stirred in my heart just almost immediately about it. And I think it's really, really good and I think you're really going to like it. Um, have you ever been going through life and you think you're doing really good as a Christian? You know, you think things are going good, you know, and what's that saying? You're floating along on, how's it say, flowery beds of ease or something like that, you know? And things are just going really good. And then the next day you wake up and your head is where your feet were, <laughs> you know? And it's like the rug was pulled out from underneath you and it just doesn't seem like that anything else can go wrong. And you just don't know what happened from yesterday to today. And you don't know how to get back up to where you were. It just seems like it just changed overnight. And you don't know what you did or how you got there. I think everybody's been there. Don't raise your hand. But I think everybody's been there. It's like you had this plan and, and things were going the way you thought. And then the devil comes along. You know, we don't live in this world alone. There's a devil out there. And as you're going along, he sets traps for you. Now, if you're listening and you're doing, God can show you. And, but sometimes, and I, I'm going to turn around because I don't want to see you this time. Sometimes we don't listen. You know that? Sometimes we just don't listen to what God's saying. So we wind up in a trap. And it ain't fun when we get there. It's a lot of pain and it's a lot of heartache and it's a lot of crying and it's a lot of Kleenexes and just all sorts of stuff. So this morning, I want to talk to you about some of that stuff. I think the ladies are really going to like the title of the message and the guys, I think they'll get there. Okay? The title of the message is called Diamonds in the Rough. See, I told you the ladies would like it. You know, when I was thinking about it, I thought about David. Think about David. He's minding his own business. He's out there hurt, dealing with the sheep and everything like that. And the next thing you know, here comes along a lion. Well, that lion... Kind of messed up his day. Wasn't just horrible. But he got past it. But can you imagine fighting with a lion? That could be a rough time, right? Could be a bad day. Would you say you had a bad day if you went home and you said, I had to fight a lion all day long? <laughs> that could be a pretty bad day. You might be scratched up and scarred up. Then you go along and the next thing that comes up against you, you have a big bear. Now, bears can be bad. With one little swipe, your head can be off. Mm, that's right. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> but David fought the bear. He was having a bad day. He fought lions and bears. He had some bad times. Keep that in mind. Okay? Turn with me, if you would, to Galatians 5. This is King James, verse 22. And I'm going to give you just a minute because I want you to do something with me when you find it. We didn't see Branson this morning. Y'all can put that back up there. Let's see Branson. Hi, Branson. Good morning. Y'all are looking good. You know, I was thinking about something as I was getting ready. Where's Keith and Jennifer? Wave, Keith and Jennifer. Everybody else quit waving. Are they there somewhere? Yeah, there they are. <laughs> There's Keith. I don't know where Jennifer. She's probably in kids. I remember one time years ago, they wrote in a testimony. And they were going through something like this. And, I, and they wrote in, uh, yeah, it's just good both of us didn't want to quit on the same day. <laughs> that's good, isn't it? Yeah, I thought, yeah, that's so true. So, so true. Everybody got Galatians 5.22? 
gave you time. Okay, now look at your neighbor or somebody. Find somebody. Don't be rebellious. Find somebody. Everybody's got somebody next to them in one direction or the other. And say, you are a spirit. spirit. Say, "Not not a ghost. But a spirit. You got it? Yes. All right. All right. Now, Galatians 5, 22. But the fruit of the Spirit, hmm? Yeah. Yeah. Who's a spirit? Okay. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, Joy, Joy. Uh uh-huh, love, Love. Uh uh-huh, peace, Peace. Uh uh-huh, long, you see that's even a long word, (laughs) long suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, and against such there is no law. You're a spirit. You're not just a flesh. You're a spirit. Now, if we was to take you and cut you right in half like this, just imagine it for just a second. We just cut her right in half. This side of her flesh and this side of her spirit. Which side of her, you know, you've seen things like this. Which side of her would you think the percentage would be more that she knows more about? Her flesh or her spirit? Imagine, think. Which side of you, cut yourself in half, just imagine it for a minute. And which side of you do you know more about? Which side of you, when you wake up in the morning, do you feel the most? <laughs> Some of you out there, which side of you did you feel the most when you didn't come to church this morning? <laughs> Your spirit man or your flesh man? That's good. Hmm. Now, we just told each other we were a spirit. Right. So what happened? Huh? We got this other thing going on, and it's called flesh. And if we feed it more than we do the spirit, it's going to be stronger than the spirit's going to be. It's going to have more power. And it's going to overtake the spirit. Do you know in the natural, if something is more powerful, it can overtake something that's weaker? Did you know that? So if this half of him over here is his spirit man, okay? And he does nothing with this side but come to church on Sunday morning and hears Keith preach for an hour. And that's an hour. How many other hours is there in a week? Somebody that's excellent. Where's our Harvard guy? 168? 168 other hours in a week. Okay? This side's 168. Well, 167 hours. That he does just exactly what he wants to do. 
Which side's going to be more powerful and which side's going to be weaker? Do you get it? Yeah. Why does it happen that your fruit ain't growing? Why does it happen that when something happens, you react the way that you do? You don't even really want to. You don't like the way you respond. You don't even like yourself after you've done it. Because you know better on this side. This side knows what to do. It's like, you know you shouldn't be eating that. You know you shouldn't be, you know, going there. You know you should be doing some exercise. You know all these things. But that don't mean you do them. You're going to leave out of here and eat some dessert today. You know it. Don't look at me that way. <laughs> but you know you shouldn't. But you know you shouldn't respond to your husband that way. You know you shouldn't treat your boss that way. You know you shouldn't. You know what I'm talking about. You shouldn't lie. You shouldn't steal. You shouldn't cheat. You shouldn't have affairs. You shouldn't uh, what all the other things are. You know you shouldn't do them. But why do you do those things anyway? Why can't you do the love? You know you should love them. You know you should. But I hate them. I hate them. Do you don't know what they did to me? I hate them. But you know you should love them. Joy. You know you should have joy. You shouldn't even be taking those pills for depression. You know why you have to take them? Because this side over here, this side over here is like this. And this side over here is touching the floor. Because the fruit of the Spirit is joy. That's that's a fruit that God gives us. It's something God given. It's a fruit of the Spirit. Joy. Peace. You're in turmoil all the time. You ever been around somebody like that? They thrive on turmoil. They thrive on something going wrong all the time. If it's not this, then it's this. If it's not this, then it's this. If it's not this, then it's this. And they got to tell you about it. And you got to fix it for them. That's who they are. There's no peace in their life. They thrive on these things. Gentleness, you're a bear all the time. You're a spouse, and you're a bear with your husband, or you're a bear with your wife. You don't want to be that way, and you go to bed and think, man, I didn't mean to be that hard. But you're too proud to say you're sorry, so you just leave it. Gentleness, goodness. You know what to do that's good, but you just ignore it. Faith, you don't even try to use your faith for it. You don't even try. Just ignore faith. Meekness, you're like a bull in a china shop. You're not going to be meek or humble about anything. You're going to tell it like it is. Temperance. You're up and down like a yo-yo. Whoop! Today you're this, tomorrow you're this. Today you're this, tomorrow you're this. Today you're this, tomorrow you're this. And no consistency about you. Who wants to be any of these things? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness. You are those things. They already exist in you. Every person in here, they exist in you. They exist in you. All you have to do is decide what you're going to do with those other 167 hours out of a week. Right. Which side of you are you going to yield to? Which side of you has more predominance in your life? When the other side starts, you have to make a decision. You have to take a wide step back 
zip it, stop it, close your eyes, and find something that's going to build you up during that time. Do it. Let's read the Living Bible. Put it up there. I know we have it. There it goes. Read the first two words. What does that mean? But when? But when? That means it doesn't happen all the time. You got it? But when the Holy Spirit controls our lives, He will produce this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But when? So you have to decide which one you like more. Some people like it. I'll just be honest with you. I have decided some people like fussing and fighting. It's what they like. But I don't like it, you know? And I don't like dealing with it, you know? So I'm going to begin to figure out how to yield more to the spirit more and less to the flesh more. You know, and I've, I've noticed something else in my life. I've noticed that things that I fought for, that I thought, this is mine, I want this. Like years ago, I used to fight. I was even more overweight than I am now, like a lot more. And um, I'd say, no, if you like me, you like this flesh, you like this fat. Well, now it's harder to get rid of the fat. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because it was something that I fought for. Well, now my cell phone's kind of been that way. I used to fight, I need my cell phone, I need to talk, da da da, and it'd, it'd bing and I'd answer it. But now it's like it never stops. Do you understand what I'm saying? Things, be careful what you fight for in your life. Because they can become something in your life that is harder for you to get rid of later on when you want to get rid of it. Be careful what you fight for in your life. Be sure that it's something that you really want. Because later on when you don't want it, it can be harder for you to get rid of. Do you understand that? Okay. People think that, we did, you didn't forget about David, did you? People think that faith people, people of true faith, people that live by faith, never, never, ever, ever have to deal with what they have to deal with. They never have a test. They never have a trial. They never have anything that they have to overcome. They never have to walk in love. They never have to walk in temperance. They never have to walk in gentleness. These things never arise in their lives. They've convinced themselves of that. They're, they've convinced themselves that people like Brother Hagen, Brother Copeland, Brother Keith, just any minister that you want to name, these, these things never really apply in their lives. They're like beyond them. <laughs> they don't have to deal with people that would cause them to have to use these gifts. <laughs> I know I used to think it was Brother Hagen. When we first met Brother Hagen and we were working with him every day, I would think, man, it must be so nice, you know, just to walk at such a level that, hmm, you just walk and everything around you is happening and you're just in a <laughs> aura in, a, in just a place all by yourself. And, and the darts come and they're, a hundred miles away and they just can't even get in close to you because you have such faith. God, what it must be to be Brother Hagen. What it must be. He must just float through life and get up in the morning with his clothes on and his hair fixed. <laughs> then I met him. And I had to fix his hair myself, so I knew that wasn't true. <laughs> and I realized these things are just not true. 
There are things that the devil tells people that are being attacked themselves so that he can bowl over them and say, if you really, really, really had faith, you'd get over this. This wouldn't be happening to you. You're a nobody. You're no good. If you really, really, really had faith, you wouldn't be attacked this way. If you really, 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 if God really loved you and you really were a Christian, this would never happen to you. How many of you the devil's told that to? Now is the time to raise your hand. Every person in this room, every person watching on the internet, every person in Branson, you get attacked with a sickness. You get attacked with a financial thing. You get attacked with a marriage problem. You get attacked with a problem with your kids. And you think, we should be beyond this. But you're not. And you're having to figure out how to deal with it. And your head is where your feet were yesterday. And it's not fun. And you're having to deal with it. And it's taken every ounce of strength that you have just to want to get out of the bed today. And you're thinking, this Christian stuff, this faith stuff, this God stuff does not work. You're convinced of it. This Bible stuff doesn't work. I know they said it. I know they can get up there and pretend like it works for them. But they don't know my life. They live a different life than I live. They've never had to face what we face every day. If they did, they wouldn't get up there and be happy. Mrs. Moore could never get up there and laugh and be so happy all the time if she had to face what I have to face every day. Just wouldn't happen. Just wouldn't happen. No, the fruit of the Spirit is joy and peace. Turn to James 1, 2. I got you your favorite verse. Say, this is going to be my new favorite verse. You're laughing. See, at least you're getting some joy now. Uh-huh. You may, you may be looking back at it after this service today. James 1-2. My brothers and sisters, count it all joy when you fall into divers' temptations. Now, Dave read this Friday night, and I couldn't believe he was reading it because, you know, anyway. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience. But let patience have her perfect work. Read this last verse. This last part of this verse. That you may be perfect and entire, wanting, wanting, everybody say it, wanting, nothing. How many of you in here are still wanting something? Every person in here. That you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Wanting nothing. Listen to the NIV. We should all just be laughing our heads off right now. (laughs) Consider it pure joy. Are you considering the mess you're in pure joy? Glory to God. Oh, I can't hardly wait for another day because it's so good. Yes. Pure joy. Yes. When you fall into divers' temptations, you think when David fell into that pit, he was counting it all joy? Knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience. But let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect Are we reading the NIV? What happened to it? We lost it. The devil didn't even want you to see it. (laughs) 
am I reading it the wrong one? Um, it may be the new NIV or something, okay? Verse 2. No. Yeah, 2. Yeah, there you go. Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. In other words, you may face two or three of them at the same time. Because you know that the trying of your faith produces perseverance. But let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. How many of you want to be lacking in nothing? Now, how many of you have heard... Okay, I'm going to step on a lot of toes right now. I like stepping on toes. Stick them out here, Victor. <laughs> the new music that's on the radio today. Christian music. I'm going to say probably 80% of the songs talk about you not being complete. My Bible says I am complete in Him. Don't listen to that mess. You are complete in Him. When it comes on, you turn it off. Say, I am complete in Him. And this also says that you may be mature and complete. Didn't say, I'm only half of a person. You don't need a spouse. You don't need a, uh, anything to be complete. Two completes can be complete, complete. Right. Amen. That's, right. That's the way God works. You don't have to be a half of anything. Amen. I know I cut you in half for an illustration, <laughs> but you're a whole. Amen. Maybe a whole, but you're a whole. <laughs> Do you got it? Okay. We're whole and we're complete in Him. Now, I thought about this and I thought about something that I really, really like. I'm not going to say I love it because, again, I think Keith's probably watching. (laughs) Or elsewise, I might say I loved it. I thoroughly, richly enjoy, have getting great pleasure out of these things. So they're going to show you a video, and I will explain to you what it is afterwards. All right? Go for it, guys. Diamond capital of the world. Diamonds were discovered in these rocks in the 19th century. Hundreds of thousands have been mined here. But only recently did scientists learn how they actually formed. Professor Steve Haggerty is an expert on how diamonds are created. Diamonds were a real mystery in terms of their origin. They were found in clusters. So you found one diamond and by golly there would be others to be found as well. So that led to the notion that the process in which the diamonds were brought to the surface uh, was possibly deep. Diamonds formed deep within the earth in an area called the mantle the layer between the Earth's crust and its superheated core. Down here, intense pressure changes the molecular structure of carbon by crushing its atoms together and forcing them into a new lattice-like structure. Under extreme pressure and temperatures, carbon becomes diamonds. The temperatures have to reach about 1500 degrees centigrade and the pressure's about 50 kilobars. That's 2,700 degrees Fahrenheit and the weight of over 4,000 grown men standing on your foot. 100 miles still remain between their source in the mantle and the Earth's surface. Luckily, They're fast-tracked to the surface by a substance called kimberlite. Kimberlite is a rock. It's the host rock to diamonds. Even though the diamonds do not form in the rock, it's the transporter. 
Kimberlite is a volcanic rock that forms deep within the earth. As it moves to the surface, it creates a carrot-shaped pipe filled with molten rock, mantle fragments, and diamonds. When it breaks through the crust, it erupts in small but violent volcanoes. I like to think of these as volcanoes of opportunity. These rows, they picked up the diamonds from their safe deposit boxes deep in the earth, about 200 kilometers down, and then were explosively erupted. At the surface, magma builds up a mound of volcanic material that eventually cools and hardens. Hidden within the rock are diamonds. Now you see what I said I like. You see, diamonds are very nice. But how do diamonds get formed? Heat and pressure. Heat and pressure. And did you hear it say 4,000? It felt like 4,000 men. Have you ever felt like every day you wake up and 4,000 people are just standing on you and won't let you have your way? Or won't give you what you're believing for? 4,000 people? Well, I liked this video so much that I thought about this. Think about faith people, the faith people that I know. True faith people. I personally know some of the trials and tests that they have been through through the years. They have been pressed on every side. And you would have never known it. They have had pressure. They have had people. They have had things day after day after day after day pressing them. And it just kept compacting them. And what it did was just exactly like it does with these diamonds. It changed their molecular structure. It changed who they were. It made them stronger. It made them tougher to be able to stand when the wind blew. They didn't just ball over and end up in their bed crying. They stood. It changed their structure of who they were. And this happened so much over a period of time. Some of them I know it took decades. And that pressure just kept pressing up against them, pressing up against them. And they were changing on the inside. And it looked like at any time, any one of them could quit because of the pressure. But no, what they did, they'd get this book out. And they'd say, no, your word says this. Right. You said this. Amen. And they kept their joy. And they kept their peace. And they were long-suffering. And they were gentle. They didn't take it out on other people. It mattered how they responded. Didn't just mean that they went through it. There's a lot of people that's been through a lot of stuff but they were torture to everyone around them. Didn't work the same. But these people, they went through these tests. These faith people went through these tests. And they stayed there where God told them to stay and put up with it, whatever it was. And that carbon kept getting pressed till it got stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. And then what happened? This was my favorite part. I hope you didn't miss it on that video. It was my favorite part. They exploded to the surface and they shine. They didn't do that on their own. This 
automatic force all of a sudden underneath the earth took them. The diamonds didn't do anything. The diamonds did nothing. But this force built a way, a path, tunneled out a path for them from underneath the earth. They didn't make their own way. Do you get it? They didn't forge their own course. They didn't have to go through anything to get from that way deep layers deep in the earth. They had to do nothing. But all of a sudden, this force took them from being carbon, which was worth nothing to no one, to being a huge diamond at the top of the earth that everyone could see and everyone valued and had great price. Do you get it? I know people today. We, were, we worked at a Bible school for years, decades. And we watched people fall off to the left. And we watched people fall off to the right. And we watched people fall off in front of us. And we watched people fall off behind us. And we would be so hurt. And we would just, our hearts would just, oh, be so sorrowful. Because they're good people. Good people. But unwilling. unwilling to stand during the test. Unwilling to let themselves become from carbon to diamond. Do you know that's not fun? Do you know pressure is not fun? Do you know trials and tests are not fun? But it's the person that will get up and say, greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. No weapon formed against me shall prosper. In the midst of whatever's going on. And nobody around them know what's going on. And you're just standing with your head high. And you're just going on. You're getting pushed this way, and you're getting pushed this way, and you're getting pushed this way, but you're still on him, right here. You're not moving. Because what you know is you can, you can live in Florida, you can move to Texas, you can move to Alaska, you can move to Hawaii, you can move to Jupiter. But nothing's going to change. Because this is where you were supposed to be. You've got to get through this test. That molecular structure inside of you has got to change from flesh to spirit. And when you become more spirit than you do flesh, when you come out of there and you get this diamond right here, if I can get it off my finger this morning, and you bite it, what's going to happen? You stomp it. What's going to happen? Nothing. Why? Because it's hard. Brother Hagen used to say, I've been criticized by experts. <laughs> you little spurts ain't going to do nothing to me. <laughs> now, why would he say that? Because he's been settled. There, I don't know of another human being that I've been with over the years. And I was close to Brother Hagen. This way. All the time. And he had some stuff going on, just like you have some stuff going on. But he was this way all the time. He never lost his joy. He never lost his peace. He never lost his faith. Nothing. 
Why could he be that way? He would tell you, because of the stuff that I suffered. He talked about it. Any of you that know him, he stayed in churches where this side of the church would fight with this side of the church. And he'd preach and it'd sound like he'd preach and the word would go back to that back wall and it'd bounce off of it like a rubber ball and come back and hit him in the face. Things, he, you, I could go on and on. Every faith person that I know, every faith person that I know has had to overcome tests and trials. And the ones that's overcome more tests and trials have become more settled, have become more established, have become stronger and stronger and stronger. Let's read our verse. Look at this, 1 Peter 5.10. In the King James. Oh, and a while ago I said David fell in the pit. That was Joseph. Getting my stories mixed up. I thought about it when I went to sit down. 1 Peter 5.10. But the God of all grace, who has called us unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus. What's this next part say? After that you suffered a while, make you perfect, establish strengthen and settle you. Let's read the New Living. Some of the, your Bibles say this uh, instead of settle you. How many of you say establish you? Yeah, some of you, I saw your hands. Okay, read First Peter out of the New Living. Okay, it says, In his, in his kindness... God called you to share in His eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus. So after that you have suffered a little while, He will restore you, support you, and strengthen you. Read that next part. And place you on a firm foundation. But it's only after these other things. Now, he didn't cause these things. It's just like what I said a while ago. Sometimes we just don't listen. Sometimes there's a devil in this world. But we can get put on that firm foundation. And like I said, we watched people. Year after year, they went to Bible school and they did this and they did that. And they just were not going to take it anymore. They're going to go out and start their own. They're going in the ministry and they're going to start their own because they've convinced themselves ministry is not work. We're going to start our own. We're going to start traveling and we're going to start pastoring and we're going to go in the ministry. That's because they are L-A-Z-Y. They don't want to hold down a job. They don't want to listen to anybody else. but they're going to stay carbon all the days of their life. All, say it with me, all the days of their life. All the days of their life. Because unless you do what God says, God will never be able to take you from the middle of the earth and shoot you to the position you're supposed to be. God is the one that you want putting you where you're supposed to be, not you. Because carbon will never shine. No matter how much you polish it, no matter how much you set it on a shelf, no matter how much you put it on a finger, it's never going to shine. Until you've been through those pressures, and until you've been through those tests, and until you've stood firm in the place that you're supposed to stand firm in, you're never going to shine. God can't put his blessings on you because you have not accomplished what you were supposed to accomplish because he knows. Not because he's mean, but because he knows the first test that the devil tries to pull on you when you get in that place, you're going down like a stack of dominoes. 
And it's going to make the word and the church, you've got a 10,000 member church and you're not ready for it. And the first test that the devil throws at you, you fall like a stack of dominoes. What's that going to do to people in that church? <laughs> They're going to fall too. Because they believed in you. You weren't ready for that place. And if you get to a place before you're ready for that place, you're going to crumble. Because carbon crumbles. You don't want to get somewhere before you're supposed to be there. That's why people are crumbling. That's why people are falling apart. They're trying to put themselves in places that they should never be. Do you remember Keith telling the story about when we first got married and the Lord dealt with him about being a pastor? How many of you remember that story? Raise your hand up high. I'd like to see it. I'd like the cameras to see it. 98% of the people in here. What did he say? What did Keith say? He wasn't ready. He didn't think he could pastor. He wasn't ready. And what did the Lord tell him? By the time I get you there, you'll be ready. What if, what if Keith had had it? Now, I know he had it. He's watching, so I'm going to say it, but I'm going to say it anyway. I know for a fact he had some of the meanest bosses you ever want to meet. One boss he had, he'd come out of the house in the morning, he'd kick his dog and cuss his wife out. He was mean. He shouldn't have been there. Wasn't where he was supposed to be. But he was still there. What if he'd have, what if he'd have just quit everybody and everything and said, you know what, I'm going to be a pastor today. They wanted him to pastor where we were. He was well received in the little churches where we were. He could have started, we could have started a church right there where we were. They would have accepted him as a pastor right there where we were in the little town we were in. What if he would have done that? What if he'd have done it? He'd have been carbon. We'd be divorced. I'm not laughing. I'm telling the truth. Because we wouldn't have been in God's will. We would not have been doing what God told us to do. We wouldn't have got the preparation we were supposed to get. We wouldn't have got settled. We wouldn't have got established. We wouldn't have got stabbed in the back in all the times we've gotten stabbed in the back. And have to patch up the holes. Get up tomorrow morning and go on. We wouldn't have had all the bad articles written about us. We wouldn't have had all the people talking about all, t throwing us under the bus so many times. Had all the bad articles written about us. But you know what? Woo! 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 We've been criticized by experts. Who are those people? What does that mean? When we started pastoring, we were ready when the newspaper threw those ugly articles saying, Pastor swoops in, <laughs> mega church, <laughs> takes the church from the city, takes the building from the city. <laughs> woo <laughs> Count it all joy. It was joy. We got a lot of people from that ad. You, you can't pay money to get on the front page. <laughs> can't happen didn't bother us at all. We just smiled and said, come on in, people. You see, we're going to be here now. And we got a lot of people from it. But what if we'd have done that years ago? That would have crushed us. Our little hearts would have been, oh, God, they talked about me. Keith, get me a Kleenex. Is that what you're doing? When somebody talks about you, why? Because you're not settled and established. What happened to David? Let's, you remember David, right? 
Remember him? He fought a lion. He got stronger. He fought a bear. He got stronger. What happened next? Did anybody read their Bible to find out what happened next? Hmm? That was just training ground. Some people, when they fight the lion and they fight the bear, they quit. Just when they fight the lion. Well, I'm not supposed to be here. I had a major test. This is not God. <laughs> this can't be God. I'm going through a test. This is not God. I've got to move. I would not be going through this if this was God. Daddy, I'm not a shepherd. I wouldn't have to be fighting bears. I wouldn't have to be fighting lions. I'm going to find a job cooking. I'm a cook now. <laughs> Keep me inside, away from lions and bears. <laughs> Who would have fought Goliath? Nobody. Who would have fought Goliath? Nobody. Who would have been prepared to fight Goliath? The whole army was there. None of them were prepared. If every person in here quits every time they have a test or trial, or crawls up in their bed and gets their box of Kleenex, or calls somebody and says, pray for me, I'm going through a test and a trial. Oh God, call the church, call the elders, call the pastors, call my friends, come pray for me. I'm going, I had to fight a lion today. Oh God, I had to fight a lion today. I had to fight a, a lion. <laughs> Instead of doing what the Bible says in Jude, when you get in a test, what does it tell you to do? Get in your closet and pray in the Holy Ghost. You call 26,000 people to pray for you. That's never going to build you up. I don't care if we had a prayer meeting and every person in here prayed for you. And that's where people are missing it. They want every person in the world. If we had a prayer chain and we joined hands around the world and every person joined their hand and they promised they would pray for you for 24 hours a day, it would never build you up. Never going to build you up. You're always going to be the one with the Kleenex and the chocolate in the bed. <laughs> or the box of ice cream or whatever it is that satisfies your whim. You're always going to be that person. Always and forever. Nobody will be able to help you. You will never grow up. You will never be these things that the fruit of the Spirit are. You'll never be them. But when the next test or trial comes your way, instead of grabbing for that idiot phone, get in your house, throw everything out of your closet. Ladies, you've got too many shoes anyway. Throw them out of there. <laughs> or whatever. Find you a place. 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 If you've got to get rid of that TV, find you a place. If you've got to get rid of some clothes, find you a place. You have more clothes than you know what to do with. Find you a place. Find you a place. If you have to wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning when the rest of your family is asleep, find you a time. Find you a place. When that next test or trial attacks you, when that next thing that everybody wants 4,000 men standing on you, putting pressure on you, you get in your prayer closet. You shut your door. You lift up your voice to God. You pray in the Spirit. You don't expect someone else to do it for you. 
And when you do that, your life's going to change. But not until then. Not until then. People say, well, it's still the same. I keep having to go through the same things over and over again. Why me, Lord? What was that song, Chris Christopher? Why me, Lord? What have I ever done to deserve all the mess I've gone through? Why? Why? Because 167 hours a day or a week, you're doing what your flesh wants to do. And one hour a week, you're doing what God wants to do. Let's change that. Let's spend some time in our prayer closet the next time that we have a test or trial. Let's kick the devil in the tush. Let's get past this test and trial once and for all. Let's get on a different level. Let's get stronger. And every time you do that, you start becoming more like a diamond and less like a piece of carbon. You start getting stronger and tougher and stronger and tougher and stronger and tougher. But I'll never be that tough. Well, Bible said you would. God said you would. You smarter than God? You smarter than the Bible? Nah. Nah, God's smarter than you. God is smarter, smarter, smarter than you. Look at Romans 15, 13. Two ways that you can tell that you're doing this. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. You start having some joy, you start having some peace, you're going to know you've started believing. Joy and peace. Those, are, those will be some of the first things that start rising up in you after you start praying. Look at it in the Amplified. The next part of this is what we were just talking about. But the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Look in those brackets right there. What does that say? Let's see. We got the right one? 22. Sorry. Verse 22. Oops. I'm back at, let's see, let's go back here. Get you right on the right verse here. Uh, five, Galatians 5.22. It helps if I give them the right verse. But the fruit of the Holy Spirit. That next part, read that with me. The work which His presence within accomplishes. So how do you get His presence within? doing what we were just saying. Finding that place that you can spend time with Him. That's how the Holy Spirit on this side of you grows within you instead of the flesh on the other side. Find that place that you can pray instead of having 5,000 people. I know what the verses say. I can, I can hear it from up here. Do you not? Know you can hear? The Bible says call for the elders of the church. The Bible says, yes, I do know those things. That's when you are babies. And if you want to stay a baby all the days of your life, you can stay a baby all the day of your life. But if you want to grow up and become a diamond instead of being a piece of carbon all the days of your life, then you're going to have to learn how to pray for yourself. You have a choice. We will pray for you. We do pray for people. We do it continuously. But I don't want to be a baby to where somebody has to spoon feed me it would be really sad if somebody had to take me to lunch today and, and feed me every thing that I ate today. That would be really sad, wouldn't it? Yes. You don't want that either. You want to be able to stand and let God catapult you, whether it's in a business. It's not just about pastoring. It's not just about doing things in the ministry side of life. Do you understand that? Maybe you are a businessman. Maybe you are an, in another occupation, and maybe you've got ideas, or maybe you've got plans. 
You can't put yourself up here. Only God can put you up here, but He can do it. And He can make you shine and draw everyone's attention to you and make you explode. But you have to go through this first to get settled and established and, and let Him put you there. Okay, one, one last thing, and then we're going to close. How many of you remember Paul in the Bible? Did he ever go through any tests or trials? Well, I, I didn't want to just give you something in the Old Testament. Some people don't even believe it exists, you know, I mean, or don't want to live by it anymore, whatever they say. I, I get so confused anymore. Paul, the one that wrote, what, 12, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 books of the Bible, the New Testament? You remember him, right? That was shipwrecked and all these other things. Did he go from being a nobody to being a somebody? Did he have to suffer things from this to this? How many of you remember a night where Paul and Silas were someplace? And they had their Kleenex box out. You may not remember this. Paul and Silas were in jail. And they cried all night long. Said, why me, Lord? We were preaching your word. Why, Lord? No. They didn't whine. They didn't whimper. They didn't complain. At all. At all. At all. When their test and trial was going on, they prayed and sang praises to the Lord. I would have you turn there, but we're ready. We'll, we'll close up. They prayed and sang praises to the Lord. They didn't whine. They didn't whimper. They prayed and sang praises. And God catapulted Paul far beyond everybody else and made him shine. God is good at the catapulting business. He's very good at it. He's very good at making diamonds out of carbon. He's very good at doing things in people's lives. But they have got to let him reconstruct them. And reconstruction can be painful when you tear something apart and put it back together again. But when you do it, you always shine and you're always better. How many of you want to be a diamond and not carbon anymore? Oh, it's so much better. You know what? Diamonds are easy to clean. Diamonds are easy to take care of. Diamonds have, they're, they're just, you can hardly destroy them. You have to do nothing to them. Do you understand what I'm saying? They are like, maintenance is obsolete almost. And that's what we want in our lives. We want our lives. Because if your life is cluttered with everything, you can't be so much good to God because you're having to work on this and 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 you're so busy doing your own thing that keeping care of yourself that when God says do this, you can't even do this because you've got to take care of this. We can't be that way. We have to have our stuff in order so that all we've got to do is get up and take a little water and you're, you're ready to go. You're ready to go. That's what diamonds are. We're all diamonds. Yes. We're just diamonds in the rough. Yes. We're getting there. We're going to just wash off and get ready to go. Can you say amen? amen? Stand up on your feet with me.